No, it's this one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, we're missing, missing one. Or my goodness. I didn't hear. You know what? Fly down. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, folks. My name is Mike Valancourt. I'm coming out of the bullpen this evening as, to act as a uh, temporary chair of the Cape Zoning Board of Appeals for our uh, Tuesday, September 27th meeting. Uh, welcome. I'll call the meeting to order. And uh, our first order of business will be to uh, review and perhaps approve the minutes of the August 23rd, 2016 meeting. Um, are there any comments on the minutes? And I would seek a motion to approve. You have a quorum. I believe we do have a quorum. Yeah. Yes, we do. So moved. So moved. The motion to approve the minutes from the uh, August 23rd meeting. Do we have a second? I'll second it. A few thank you. Any discussion uh, on the minutes? And, and I'll give Matt, Michael, a moment to settle in. Hey, problem. Excuse me. <coughs> We're just talking minutes. Do you have anything yeah, on the minutes? I don't. I reviewed okay. them. So. Very good. All right. Uh, looks like we don't have any comments or questions on the minutes. Um, so uh, without any further ado, uh, we'll vote on those. Uh, motion to approve. All in favor? Yep. Any opposed? Very good. The motion carries. Um, Next item on the agenda is old business. We have no old business to consider, so we'll move on to new business. And we'll hear the administrative appeal of Sean Tamir, owner of the property at 1 Crescent View Avenue, map U16, lot 36. And Mr. Tamir is appealing the notice of violation issued by the code enforcement officer on July 18th, 2016. Uh, Mr. Tamir, welcome to, to take the podium and, and address your appeal. Ladies and gentlemen of the uh, board, Mr. Chair, thank you for giving me the opportunity to stand here in front of you and appeal an ordinance that was drafted and uh, I guess just about maybe three years ago and failed to take in account the very few multi-unit properties that we have here in, in Cape Elizabeth and I happen to own one of them. Uh, I was grandfathered uh, multi-unit when I purchased a property nearly nine years ago and um, at the moment uh, what's in front of you and before you is an appeal to the ordinance which allows homeowners to rent their properties um, I guess in a high season or in general for one week at a time um, which exclude multi-unit buildings which I have three units which I reside in one of them with my children and I wish to have the opportunity to rent the other two units um, as I have for the last couple of months uh, provided that I will adhere to the other rules of the ordinance which is at least uh, one week uh, in minimum and provided that I adhere to the other demands uh, of the ordinance. So I wanted to come before you and have you hear my argument which is really quite simple and straightforward. When, when the ordinance was drafted, it did not take into account a multi-unit apartment buildings. And I'm thinking that we've got quite a few um, uh, condominium associations. So if somebody, an individual or a partnership, would happen to own more than one or two or three units within a condominium association, they're not prohibited from renting their individual units, may they own one, two, three, or four, uh, to vacationers or particularly in my case, what I've experienced is mainly family and friends of residents of Cape Elizabeth that come here and either cannot find uh, accommodations nearby or cannot afford the inn by the sea or uh, moreover cannot necessarily be invited to the homes of their families and friends maybe because of size or space or anything of that nature and I wanted to bring that before you for consideration so so then your issue is with the language in subsection B further not more than one 
short-term rental agreement shall be entered for any given property for any consecutive seven-day period. Is that Correct, the, Mr. Chair. the crux of the issue? Yes. Okay. Everything else has been uh, has been handled, and at this point. Uh, questions for the applicant from the board. So, have you complied with the E standards, the code compliance, building evacuation plan? I apologize. I could not hear what you asked. Have you complied with uh, section E of that section of the ordinance uh, regarding code compliance, the building evacuation plan, sanitary waste disposal? I believe that I did, sir. I, I issued a permit to Mr. Tamir today for one of his units, so he's complied with part one of my notice of violation to secure one permit. So we're really here to talk about the second part, renting uh, more than one unit on a short-term basis. And I did inspect the one unit for code compliance and it met the requirements. I haven't inspected the other two. And, and so there, ha there have been issues then with the consecutive seven-day period. Is that the? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at the sort of the second participle here of, of the of the ordinance. Further, not more than one short-term rental agreement shall be entered for any given property for any consecutive seven-day period. So, you, so what what you really want to do then is you would like to have multiple units available for rental at basically the same time. Right, and, and Mr. Chair, what I'm saying is that when the ordinance was drafted, it didn't really take in consideration the very few multi-units that we've got here, and we can probably count on, on one hand. Uh, yes, and that, that is what I want to bring before you, that it was excluding that or did not include that, and I, I think that it's just fair to include that. And, and not necessarily less than seven days. I think that I'm, I'm fine with, with that aspect of the ordinance. It's just to include the other two units that I've got. Yeah. Mr. Shamir, you understand we're not in the business of redrafting the ordinance. I know, but uh, maybe a variance is what I'm asking for. Other questions for the applicant? Seeing none, Mr. Tamir, thank you. And, uh, You're we'll welcome. And certainly, I'm we'll have follow if we have follow-up questions, we'll call you back yeah, forward. Please do. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have other members of the public uh, here this evening, so we, we would welcome anybody forward who, who has any comments on the uh, application. Uh, members of the board, um, Mr. Tamir, Sean. My name is Mike Duddy. I live at 11 Crescent View Avenue. Uh, but um, what I first want to do is make some comments for Mr. Jamie Erskine, who lives at 6 Bowery Beach Road. That's the house immediately to the north, but adjacent to um, Mr. Tamir's property. Mr. Erskine suffers from a medical condition that's quite serious, keeps him confined to a wheelchair. It was simply not practical for him to be here tonight. He has provided me a letter he asked me to read to you and then to give to you so that he could at least make his comments known to the board. And so this is um, the letter written and signed by James Erskine, 6 Bowery Beach Road. I, I am writing you today to express my concern about the B&B &B located at 1 Crescent View Avenue. I have watched Mr. Tamir direct cars onto his front yard and have them park their cars onto my lawn and exit across my property out onto the road. I am not begrudging anyone with making money as long as they do it within the legal boundary of the law. Mr. Tamir isn't following the law, got fined, and is using this process to keep his B&B &B open all summer. 
I have had the displeasure of having to pick up beer cans, trash, and loud people yelling and screaming all hours of the night and had to yell out my window to ask them to quiet down. I ask you to hold him to the uh, lines of the law and comply or close it down. Uh, respectfully, James Erskine. I'd like to provide this letter for the record. Uh, and if I could have just a couple of moments to make remarks on my own again. I live at 11 Crescent View Avenue with my wife, Jennifer. Um, it's never comfortable being here to speak in opposition to something that one, somebody in the neighborhood wants to do. And I, I do it reluctantly, Sean. Um, but I do do it because I think it's meaningful. Um, the, um, the situation that the neighborhood faced this summer with the short-term rentals occurring on Mr. Tamir's property was not appropriate. Especially earlier in the summer, there were times when I personally witnessed large crowds drinking, congregating, pr partying on the property around his fire pit, which is right along the entrance to Kettle Cove Road, um, being loud and obnoxious. Um, lots of people, um, more than a dozen. Um, and I personally witnessed mornings after some of those gatherings that appeared to be just short-term rental people uh, with lots of cars, lots of people with beer cans and bottles strewn all over the property, um, food wrappers around the fire pit, just looking really objectionable. There was a lot of discussion in this town about the problems associated with short-term rentals and how to try to strike a balance between the appropriate expectations of a residential neighborhood to be able to live in quiet and peace in a way that you expect in a residential neighborhood of primarily families versus the expectations and rights of landowners to be able to use their property for revenue. The balance that was struck by the town council was to impose certain limits on the um, uh, rental of, uh, or on the use of short-term rentals. Mr. Tamir has not complied with those terms all summer long. Now, he's had a right to appeal, but it's been extremely unneighborly to drag it out for the neighborhood who's had to put up with this throughout the summer. I disagree with Mr. Tamir that the um, issue of multi-unit properties was not part of the overall discussion for leading to short, uh, the short-term rental ordinance. I think it was part and parcel of that. And in fact, the issue with short-term rentals is that if you're not careful and you allow short-term uh, short rentals to occur in multi-use properties, you convert those properties, which by and large are all located in residential areas of the town, into hotels or bed and breakfasts where they don't belong. Now, it's no coincidence that in this case, Mr. Tamir several years ago asked the town council to rezone his property to operate a bed and breakfast at that location. The neighborhood was extremely opposed to it, um, and the town council declined to rezone the property. What, what Mr. Tamir has tried to do with the unpermitted use of short-term rentals in all of his units over the summer is to, in effect, negate what the town council refused to do and to operate essentially a mini hotel or bed and breakfast on his property. It is not consistent with the nature of the neighborhood at Crescent View in the surrounding Kettle Cove region. It not only detracts from our property values as adjacent neighbors, it detracts from our quality of life in the neighborhood. It's particularly poignant because Mr. Tamir's property is located at the gateway into our neighborhood. There's only one way in and one way out of Crescent View Avenue. In order to go into our homes every day and leave our homes every day, we must go by Mr. Tamir's property. And when there is unpermitted use, unsupervised short-term rentals going on, it really detracts from your living experience. Every single weekend you go by saying, there it is again, he's at it again. It really undermines the whole point of having a nice neighborhood.
again, I, I reluctantly come here and speak in opposition. Um, but I think it's important for, for our enjoyment of the neighborhood, for the neighbors. I've not met any neighbor who's in favor of extending short-term rentals to, to multiple units in Mr. Tamir's property. I do believe the town council considered that exact issue in arriving at the ordinance. Um, I don't believe this board has any authority to interpret the ordinance contrary to the plain terms of the ordinance, nor is there any provision in the ordinance for a variance. If anything, this is an issue that goes back to the town council, but at this level we would object to issuing a permit for more than one short-term rental in that building. And we also object to any abusive use of the one short-term rental, either with too many cars on the property or too many people within seven-day periods. What we've observed in the neighborhood, although I can't verify it because I'm not checking his calendar, is that the rentals occur in very short order. Again, we don't object to a permit being issued if that complies with the ordinance for one unit in the building, provided that Mr. Tamir complies with the ordinance for that one unit and that a permit is not extended to a second unit in the building. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dudley. Other comments? Hello, my name is Kate Wolf, and I live at 5 Crescent View Avenue in the property that is adjacent to 1 Crescent View Avenue. Mr. Tamir of 1 Crescent View Avenue has been operating an illegal three-unit Airbnb for two summers now. His listings have allowed up to 25 guests to stay at his property at a time. He was told early in June that he needed to fill out an application and that if he was approved, he could have only one rental unit on the property, a two-bedroom unit can have up to six guests and no more than one set of guests per week. Mr. Tamir has ignored this and continues to rent multiple units to multiple visitors a week. I have photographs of screenshots from the Airbnb site of people's reviews proving that he has had more, multiple visitors in a week. And I have photographs of up to nine cars parked at a time. He had people park in the front of the house and the side of the house. I had times this summer where I had people, drunk people, underneath my bedroom window at 2 o'clock in the morning hollering to each other about how many more air mattresses they're going to bring into the house. I had many nights last summer and this summer that I slept with the windows all closed and earplugs in because I couldn't sleep because it was so loud next door. I've called the police with noise complaints numerous times. I've contacted the zoning board and the town manager by phone, email, and in person to insist that Mr. Tamir be held accountable to be fined, to be shut down. It never happened. I believe that any, if anyone, anyone on the town council or on the zoning board lived next door to him, it would have been shut down last summer. If Mr. Tamir doesn't follow the zoning laws now, what makes anyone believe that he will follow the laws if allowed a permit? If it's stated on the town zoning laws that short-term rentals require permits and inspections and Cape Elizabeth refuses to inspect and enforce these regulations, the town risks a major liability lawsuit if there's an accident or a fatality on the premises. Not only am I adamantly opposed to Mr. Tamir changing the zoning, but I'm requesting once again that the town make him comply with the existing laws and fine him whenever he doesn't. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Any other members of the public who wish to comment this evening? You may. Once again, members of the board, chairman, my neighbors. Uh, I, I have heard some um, untrue allegations here, and, and it is unfortunate. And I have heard some legitimate concerns at the same time. Um, I, I think that it's imperative that I comment on some of them 
without making a big deal and, and blowing this whole issue out of proportion. But, um, Mike, going back to several years ago when I have brought into town the, an application to allow bed and breakfast in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Bed and breakfast were not allowed at the time. Um, I had purchased the property with my ex-wife at the time, and as we lived in it, we really saw an opportunity to do something for the town and for us that hasn't been done before. I mean, the town does not have a bed and breakfast and hadn't had one ever. And the property, if, if any of you have looked at the map or maybe are personally familiar with the property, it is really located in sort of like a transitional zone. Uh, there is the creamery right across the street from my property that invites thousands of people throughout the summer. We've got Killer Cove Beach that invites thousands of people and visitors throughout the summer every year. Um, and at the time when I had put in an application to allow bed and breakfast, we had measured the number of vehicles that had come in and out of Kettle Cove Beach on a daily basis. And it was, I still have the data, I don't have it in front of me, but it was a really large number. And to say that a bed and breakfast, which any bed and breakfast all around the world that I've been to, are always tucked in neighborhoods. They're never in, on a main street or on a busy highway, just like a hotel or a motel. All bed and breakfasts are always a very low key, uh, a very low profile, a place that people come in for the atmosphere and for the neighborhood feel. Uh, to say that it, it, would, it would ruin or take away from the quality of life of the, of the neighborhood or the neighbors is it, it, a stretch. I think it's an overstatement. But nevertheless, you know, I did have my battle with the town, and finally, after a long two years, they've allowed bed and breakfast in the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, with some provisions that excluded my property. And I was the only one out of 8,200 people in town that wanted to do it. And one of the arguments was, well, we don't want to open floodgates to owners of properties in Cape Elizabeth to come in and open bed and breakfast. Well, nobody did but myself. And six months later, few people of few members of the group had asked me to bring the matter in front of them again because they thought that they would be, it would be approved and my property would be approved. Needless to say, I didn't do it. But, but to say that, that that my, the property as a bed and breakfast, which is not, takes away from the livelihood of, and the quality of life of, of my neighbors. Well, the majority of the people, Mike, had actually signed a petition in my favor to open or to turn the property into a bed and breakfast. We had nearly 925 signatures, the majority of my neighbors, that supported the bed and breakfast. And I'm talking about a full-fledged bed and breakfast, not like what we are having right now, what we are talking about right now, which is, you know, a, a one week, a permit to operate a one week to rent someone's home for one week. Anybody that buys a property on Kettle Cove... What is the relevance of this conversation? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the, the bed and breakfast you, application. You, you make a fair point. I, 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 I think I, we can... I we're we're really bit. not talking about bed right. and breakfast right. applications. But I... We need to focus on fair enough. Thank you on the actual application. So thank you for directing me. So in in, in lieu of what was what we heard here, uh, there was one incident, one single incident that I'm very regretful, very sorry that it happened. That guests of mine abused the situation and abused the property and abused my kindness, and I was not home when that happened. And mind you, I don't rent the three units. I didn't rent the three units. I live in one of them with my daughters, with my six-year-old and nine-year-old daughter. And it was abuse. And it was unpleasant. And I only learned about it the next day. And it was too late for me to do anything to rectify the situation. And my apologies to my neighbors that you had really suffered that sort of discomfort. And had I been in your shoes, I probably would have been angry and uncomfortable as well. But to say that every night, or multiple nights that it happened, to say that somebody stood behind, under your, your, your window is, is a flat out lie. And I'm sorry to say that because there is a wall that separates my property from the property that she rents. 
And anyhow, so it, it, it's it, to, to stand here and smear and say things that are inaccurate uh, is, is not really a neighborly thing to do. And why don't we have other neighbors in my neighborhood coming in here to speak against it? I think my neighbors, the majority of my neighbors, just on Crescent View, are all supportive of what we're doing. I put a lot of money in upgrading and, and uplifting the building on the exterior and the interior. I've done a lot of things to actually increase the property values of our neighbors on Crescent View. Um, talking about conduct, um, what's to say and who's to say that if a single family unit that rents anywhere in the neighborhood or in my neighborhood cannot have a bad crowd one night that they rent for the week or people don't go out of control and, and are misbehaving? It, 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 does, that, does that constitute or, or does that say that a person does not comply with the ordinance? Of course I want to comply with the ordinance. Of course I don't want anybody that's rowdy or having beer bottles in the morning. But that's my property. To say how many cars that can possibly park on my property, which is almost a little shy of, of, of two acres, can my neighbors say that I cannot have more than five or 10 or 15 vehicles parking on my, on, on my property? I just don't know where does it stop and where does it where, where can we say, all right, you have a two-unit or three-unit property versus a, a one single-family home. If an, if an incident happens, does that necessarily say that every time it happens? Sure. Uh, understood. Thank you, Mr. Samir. You're and we'll direct any questions we might have to you. Thank you. Um, there are no further comments from members of the public. Uh, ben McDougall is our code enforcement officer. Ben, did you receive anything uh, via submissions, email, or, or letter, or anything like that? Yeah, it, I, they all made it into your packets, okay. I believe. We had comments from Gary Cummings, 36 Richmond Terrace, uh, Jennifer Starr and Jean Lesner, of owners of Five Crescent View. Okay. I believe those were both in your packets. Okay. Very good. Given there's no further public comment, I would uh, close the comment uh, session at this time and uh, turn this over for uh, board consideration. Well, I was just looking at the, the definitions of uh, short-term rental, which are in the front of our ordinance here. And those definitions for short-term rental say as follows, the use of a dwelling offered for rent for transient occupancy by tenants for a tenancy of less than 30 days, excluding motels, hotels, and bed and breakfast. So the latter three don't concern us in this particular instance. The question is, um, is, is there a use of a dwelling? Well, if we go further to the definition of a dwelling, dwelling is a building containing one or more dwelling units and used for human habitation. It seems to describe the situation that, that exists in the current uh, uh, case. And that having been said, I, I don't think, see how one can escape the application of the short-term standards to this particular property. I would <clears throat> also just take a second. I mean, the actual language is very clear. Further, not more than one short-term rental agreement shall be entered into for any given property for any consecutive. Not more than one short-term rental agreement. It doesn't say per unit. Um, if it didn't matter how many units for, presumably wouldn't specify. Furthermore, the logic that the statute was intended to apply to one unit properties, it's not okay, but if you have three or four or five, then it's okay. So you can have plenty of short-term rentals if you have more units, but none if you have only one. Um, I don't understand that logic, and the language is crystal clear. No, we're, we're closed for, for board discussion now. Additional comments from the board? i uh, just make an observation that I think the parking is also an issue. Um, there's a space requirement, two spaces per uh, two people, I believe. Um, and I think there's space in the driveway, possibly for four cars, um, unless you include the, the barn space. Um, 
<coughs> which suggests that there may be an issue of the parking, which means that there's no evidence before us to say that the parking has been satisfied. And that's one of the criteria that's in the um, And that would be an E4 on page 239, talking about um, the parking requirement. So if we're not there for the parking requirement, uh, we have a, a practical problem, even if these other requirements are met. And uh, my last, Go ahead. I, I suspect that Ben can be addressing the parking in a moment. My other query is that my understanding of this provision is that it's an allowance, a tolerance for homeowners uh, property owners in town to expand the use, a limited use of their properties. Um, and I seem to recall this came up, well, it says effective date was December 2012. And that there, this, seem, my recollection is that this type of problem uh, occurred that generated this specific code provision, that larger properties were allowing other people to rent um, their properties and their as the party zone. That's not what the town wanted. And obviously, the neighbors in this area are, are aggravated. Um, so I can see why this is here, and I, I agree that this is a clear uh, provision. Um, and the applicant has some difficulty meeting the requ requirements. I, I was just going to mention he, he probably isn't lacking space to park. He's, he's good. He has a pretty big driveway, pretty big yard. Um, so I, how do you square a parking on the lawn bit? Uh, there's no, it, there's, there's no prohibition to, for, for parking on the lawn. So uh, under, I take your point, under that provision for the parking, I'm on page, Thirty-nine. Sorry, I'm going to section um, section nineteen seven eight, and okay. then there's a table on nineteen seven eight and paragraph twelve. Nineteen seven eight. Which is on page one eighty one at the top. And it describes short term rental. Uh, one space per per two tenants. And so then, theoretically, there should be plenty of space, but you know, the, if you have plenty of space, you don't park on the lawn. So I, I have a, a factual conflict as to how we square that there is um, um, plenty of space in the driveway, but they're still parking, that, which means that there are more people. I, I mean, it could be a matter of access and, and the way it's, the way it's actually, there could be tandem spaces that could be just easier to access onto the front lawn or the side lawn. Okay. So the, the, the spaces could exist somewhere else in the property, but a person might say, oh, it's easier to park on the front yard, and nobody's prohibiting that person from doing it. Well, I perceive the, the parking requirement is a way to pacify the, the, the requirement as having a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. You park in the parking spaces. And, the, you know, to... Well, I, I think, valid point. I think, really, the... the argument here is what is the meaning of pro a property? And Mr. Tamir seems to think a property is each maybe individual unit, so each one could have a permit. And what we're saying, what we're saying is that the property is the actual um, Yes, I agree with lot. that, that there's one lot. And so we don't have to look at the parking. And that there would be, if there's three units and he's occupying one, he'd have to have six parking spaces. Mm -hmm. Is that how we all look at that requirement? Oh, sure, but I'm saying I, we could argue we don't have to go there because the, the ordinance applies to property. And so you can only have one permit, or one, um, yeah, one short-term rental permit per property, which he has now. He's seeking more than one. I'll park the, the parking, no pun intended, I'll park the parking point. The point that I'm... Uh, I'm raising is that I, I, there's an, a fundamental issue whether there's sufficient parking. Mm. All right, that's a, a function for the code enforcement officer assessment. That there's an application for that. I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm just troubled that 
neighbors are annoyed. There's a testimony of people parking on the lawn, which then, ergo, it suggests that there's insufficient parking, or there's just way too many people at the, at the property. Okay. Further comments from the board? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I see this um, in a little simpler terms, I guess. We have an application before us uh, appealing Ben's decision. Um, <clears throat> uh, and certainly Mr. Tamir is um, questioning the applicability of, uh, of the ordinance to the entire property. Um, but I think we're all reading it kind of the same way, <laughs> where there's, it's limited to one short-term rental on the entire property. Um, so for me, I, I, I think the parking issue is something that um, goes to the, the short-term rental permit uh, in Ben's to review that and issue that if he determines there's enough parking. Um, I think we're looking at section 19814B. Frankly, I think it's as simple as that. And for me, I, you know, I, I don't know what the, the council had in mind when they drafted this. I wasn't, wasn't there at the time. But um, certainly the way I read it is that that, uh, that section would apply to the entire property. And Mr. Tamir would be allowed one short-term rental pro uh, permit for the property. seems like everybody has, has commented on this, so I think at this point we're probably looking for a motion, and it sounds like the motion would be to, to deny the administrative, administrative appeal of Sean Tamir, um, owner of the property at 1 Crescent View Avenue, uh, with regard to the code enforcement officer's notice of violation dated July 18th, 2016. Uh, would anybody care to... Make so moved. motion. So moved. Very good. Excellent. Uh, do we have a second? Okay. We have a second. Uh, we'll open the motion for discussion now. Any discussion on the motion? I was just changing to we make a, we making a motion to uphold the code enforcement officers. A, 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 a friendly a friendly amendment that works. I think that works. Any discussion on on that? All in favor of the motion. All opposed? Uh, Mr. Tamir, before we get to the findings of fact, I, I guess I would just simply mention to you that we are a, a basically a quasi-judicial body of the town. We are charged with interpreting the ordinances. And so we don't have the opportunity to expand or, or contract the meaning of the ordinance. We have to read it as it, as it reads and, and, and apply it in that manner. Um, to the extent that you want to look into uh, possibly changing the ordinance, I'd suggest that you go to the town council and speak with the council about that. Um, I believe there's an ordinance review committee. You might start with them. You know, there are avenues to, to look into these sorts of changes, uh, but our job here is simply to enforce the ordinances as they are drafted and written. Uh, which is I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but we have already c conducted our deliberations and, and those are closed, so it's not really the appropriate time for questions. But I, just, I did just want to offer you that explanation. Um, all that being said, we do need to move through our findings of fact. Uh, and the findings of fact are uh, proposed as follows. On July 18th, 2016, the code enforcement officer issued a notice of violation regarding the manner in which the property is being rented out. The subject lot is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. The current use of the property is a three-unit apartment building. Mr. Tamir began renting two or three units of his apartment building on a short-term basis. On June 14th, the code enforcement officer informed Mr. Tamir verbally that he was not allowed to rent more than one of his apartment units on a short-term basis. After several discussions with Mr. Tamir, a notice of violation was issued on July 18th, 2016. On August 16th, 2016, Mr. Tamir submitted an administrative appeal. Mr. Tamir attempted to submit the appeal the day prior. 
the town hall was closed. Um, thoughts from the board on the proposed findings? I, just a point of order. There's not an issue with timeliness of the appeal. The board agrees that it's timely even though it was, I think it's a 30-day window. So should we include that? Because we've already discussed it. That's not an issue before us. I'm sorry, we've I, already I've, discussed I, the application. I haven't done the actual day count, but if, if, if Mr. Schmier did attempt to uh, submit the appeal uh, the day prior, I don't, I don't see a problem with including that in the record. I have one uh, potential addition to the findings of fact, if I could offer it for your consideration. And it would read as follows. Under the current ordinance, the property in question satisfies the definition of a dwelling that must meet the short-term rental standards of section 19-8-14 uh, when units are rented on a short-term basis. I think that's more specificity than we need to find. I think sometimes too much specificity can be tricky. Well, having just had a remand in which the opposite <laughs> was the case, uh, I, I feel c more comfortable uh, putting this forward, but it's for your consideration. Uh, see how everyone feels about that. I don't have a concern with the addition myself. Um, it clearly addresses the, the dwelling issue. Well, you're then relying on that as the reason for the finding rather than just enforcement of the code to this property. Well, the, the, you've, I'm, you've narrowed it. Essentially, uh, I suppose that that's true in a certain sense. Uh, we would have to ask Ben whether whether or not that was part of uh, the reason that he uh, uh, made made or or found a violation in this particular instance, or whether it wasn't, whether there was uh, less than that involved, whether he considered it at all. I did consider that. I, did, I didn't say it specifically, but you, I, I do consider it to be a dwelling and with the three dwelling units in it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think your finding of fact is problematic in, in any way. I think it's a relatively general statement about the situation. And we did learn from that remand that we should add a couple findings of fact versus simply saying we agree with the code officer. I, and I don't think it narrows our, our, our decision in any way. I, I'm comfortable with it myself. So, um, would you like me to repeat it? I suspect that that was yeah, well. I guess we, I guess you should. Why don't you? That'd be great. And we'll have it. And if someone reconsiders, that's fine. Under the current ordinance, the property in question satisfies the definition of a dwelling that must meet the short-term rental standards of Section 19-8-14 when units are rented on a short-term basis. Again, you're going out of your way to make a finding that was not asked for that I think then becomes part of why we turned it down, which gives him the ability to, in a sense, appeal it further on that narrow basis, which is not there and not necessary and not called for in the statute that's cited by Ben. It makes it more vulnerable. Well, I, I, I don't see it that way. Um, <laughs> But, but certainly I understand what you're saying. Any further comments or discussions on the findings of fact? We will need to address this issue with the additional findings. Um, it, it 
seems that what the board wishes to consider is is a motion to approve the findings of fact. Wait, wait. Are, are we adding that? What I was about to say is it seems as though the board wishes to consider the additional findings of fact with the, uh, with the proposed amendment, with the proposed addition. Okay. I guess I'd like to vote on the amendment separately. Okay. We, uh, Boy, you're really going to test the parliamentary procedure here, but I think I can handle it. I think I'm up for your challenge. Um, no, I think what we would. Uh, I, Why is it not just a proposal to amend? All right. So we so so what we would entertain is a motion to approve the findings of fact as they currently stand, and then anybody who chooses to propose an amendment would do that. So do we have a motion to approve the findings of fact as it originally drafted and read into the record by myself? Do we have that motion? I'll make the motion. Well, okay, we'll make the motion. <laughs> do we have a, a second? Second. We've got a second. Okay, good. Um, so I think I now understand that we have a, a motion to amend. Yes, I move to amend uh, okay. with the addition of the language I suggested. And do we have a second? Second. We've got a second. Okay. So I think I think we, we now consider the motion to amend first and foremost. Um, any discussion on the motion to amend? Okay. So we'll vote then on the motion to amend the findings of fact. All in favor of the motion to amend the findings of fact, please raise your hand. All opposed to the motion to amend. Okay. Good. One, two, three, five, one. Okay, so the motion to amend is approved. All in favor of approving the findings of fact as amended, please raise your hand. Okay. All in favor. Thank you. I think that concludes our business here this evening. Thank you all. Uh, any further comments from the board? Without comment, we'll go ahead and adjourn. Thank you all. Thank you.